Cool. Good evening, everyone. Am I? How am I? Welcome to Google Aotearoa. Uh, my name is Christopher Menda, and I have the pleasure of working with a team of cloud technologists here, as well as running the event for tonight. So um, <laughs> I am going to start by a, bit, a little bit of housekeeping. And I've got my list here to make sure I catch them all. One, restrooms, you'll basically follow back out where you came in. But before you hit the front desk, hang a left, and down the hallway, you'll see a sign that will take you where you need to go. In the event of an emergency, which we've had before, we've had 100 people in here, you will go out the same direction. And either sides of the bathrooms, there are stairwells that will take you out. And uh, it's something we can complete within the appropriate time. Now, the other thing that I do want to also uh, highlight is for name tags, please make sure that we always keep them visible. You are welcome to take photographs as long as they face away from the windows that go into the working spaces. And they, they aren't of Googlers that aren't necessarily involved in the event. There are probably about 10 Googlers that are involved, that number of you have already had conversations with, and um, I hope to continue that throughout the night. So now it is my pleasure to hand over to Google New Zealand director, Carolyn Rainsford. Piora tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Te manawa tu, te manawa ora, te Māori tu, te Māori ora, haumie, huie, taekurie. Welcome everyone to our Google New Zealand home. Our first purpose-built office here in New Zealand, which we opened in August 2021. And speaking to a few of you tonight, this is for many of you your first visit of both Google coming to New Zealand, but also New Zealand embracing all that Google has to offer. Now, there's no better way of doing that than presenting the four beautiful terrains that we have in New Zealand, from our beautiful mountain landscapes in the back of the office, right through to New Zealand's beautiful beaches here, represented by the Pawa meeting room. It's really wonderful to be here um, kicking off the official Tech Week, um, because when we opened this office, we wanted this office to be really a hub where New Zealanders and New Zealand businesses could come to celebrate the incredible opportunities we have in technology and innovation. And that is exactly what Tech Week um, aspires to do, to really unlock the opportunities that we have now and into the future with technology and innovation. I want to say a special welcome to New Zealand Tech's Graham Muller, the CEO, who will be addressing you shortly. And later on, Graham will welcome the Honourable Ginny um, Anderson as well. And thank you to our group of panelists here tonight as well. I've been the proud leader of Google New Zealand for the last five years, and it's quite serendipitous to be standing here with you today, because when I joined Google five years ago, the very first keynote that I did was for New Zealand Tech Week 2018, where I spoke about the incredible topic of AI. And I looked back actually earlier today on what I spoke about that, and I spoke about my very young children at the time embracing technology in a very natural and seamless way, and now my eight-year-old has certainly surpassed me with her digital prowess. Um, but I spoke about the incredible progress that we were making in the field of artificial intelligence, how it was enabling us to solve some of the world's biggest people challenges as Google, but also making sure that we were enabling the developer community and other organizations to really embrace um, artificial intelligence and what it could mean for the world. So Google is now seven years into our journey as an AI first company, and we're at an absolute inflection point. Our CEO has said that AI is going to be more profound than electricity. And it was just last week that we presented our um, infamous Google I.O. event where we showcase our very latest technology, predominantly to the developer community. Because being a very open source company, we believe that we need to enable the developer, developer community so that we can all thrive with together with the potential for AI. So over the last week, we have announced many profound um, 
challenges, but also profound opportunities that will come from AI. And of course, our very, um, very profound investment in generative AI with our um, BARD generative language model that has been launched in March. So um, if you haven't, please take a look at those announcements. But tonight, I just wanted to welcome you all. Enjoy your evening. Look forward to talking to you many as the evening progresses. And now I'll hand over to Graham. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Caroline. He mihi tēnei e ki te mana whenua, he mihi tēnei ki nga kai kōrero, he mihi tēnei ki a koutou. Ko Graham ala tōku ingawa, nō Toronga ahau, he kai whakahare mātua ahau, ko NZ Tech tōku rōpū. Tēnā koutou. So I'm Graham Muller, as you've heard, uh, Chief Executive of NZ Tech, and uh, I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time up here. Usually I like to be the centre of attention, as you yeah. all know. Uh, but uh, today I thought I'd just quickly share one or two quick points about what's happening with Tech Week and NZ Tech, and we'll pass it over to the panellists. Uh, and then after the panel, we'll, get, we'll just keep asking questions and engaging and chatting away and keeping them engaged until the Minister arrives. And then we'll get an, an announcement and some discussion with her. Uh, so yeah, NZ Tech, so welcome. This is actually the 11th, would you believe, year of NZ Tech. It started in 20, 2012. I don't know if you can remember back that far, and we started to try and put on some events around the High Tech Awards. It was called the Tech and Innovation Week. And then along came uh, Atid in 2016, and they could see the real opportunity here, and, and they invested heavily in it, and Tech Week became Tech Week. Uh, and then they passed that back to us, and we took it on the road around the country and eventually expanded it to the whole country. So now every year we have events in something like 28 different towns. There's about three or 400 events happening, online, hybrid events, events inspiring young kids into technology, events on Marae, um, engaging with uh, local uh, iwi and pop, uh, uh, hapu around uh, opportunities, events with investors looking for new ideas, events like these, events, you know, any number of them. So that's great. We've got this, this thing going, and Tech Week's just about raising the attention of how important tech is for New Zealand. Some of the other things we've been doing, and we'll hear a bit hopefully from the Minister shortly, is trying to get an in industry uh, transformation plan in place, which uh, is a roadmap with the government of how we're going to boost tech up in New Zealand. Uh, we're also doing quite a lot of work around sustainability in tech. So if any of you are interested in a better New Zealand and a sustainable New Zealand, um, have a look at some of the work we're doing there. Uh, technology roadmap, the emissions reduction plans on the, on the cards. Uh, tech around equity, making sure that people have the opportunity to engage with tech, with the tech sector, with tech careers. Education and skills, uh, encouraging more people into the sector. I could go on, there's lots we do. Uh, NZ Tech basically is now made up of 15 technology associations, 2,000 members. So thank you all, if you're not a member, nztech.org.nz forward slash join. Um, it's very reasonable, lots of cool things. You can join the other thousand people out there that are helping. Uh, with that, I would like to um, pass it over to the panel. I would like to introduce Megan Tapsell, one of our great leaders in the space. She is also the chair of the AI Forum. And Megan tonight is gonna to facilitate a really interesting panel discussion across various parts of the associations in the tech sector. Over to you, Megan. Thank you. Kia ora. Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, can I please, um, actually, firstly. Ho mai kua ho taringa Te amiri e Ki te miere He reo miere Ko te reo tēnei mea te hangara Ho mai kua Ho mai kua, ho mai e. So what I've just shared with you is a poll. And what I asked you to do was to listen, to lend me your ears tonight so that you may hear about this sweet honeyed thing called technology. Because of course that's what we're here for. Um, I am not the expert. We have a beautiful panel here today that I'd like to introduce and bring to the stage. Um, these panellists are made up of our uh, executive directors 
and one CEO, I noted, of our industry member forums. Um, so can I please invite to stage Brendan O'Connell, our CEO of Agritech New Zealand. Jason Roberts, our Executive Director of Fintech New Zealand. Madeline Newman, our Executive De Director for our AI Forum New Zealand, which I have to say is the best forum and Executive <laughs> Council that we have. And Alison Mackey, who holds a number of roles, is here tonight on behalf of Blockchain New Zealand, but also works with Location Tech, IoT and EdTech. <laughs> And we also have with us today, Head of Google Cloud New Zealand, Paul Dearlove. And can I ask you all to move along one seat? And Paul, excellent. Kia ora. Can I have you at the side there? So I've heard a few inspiring words being spoken around from Caroline, around inflection points and, and around profound challenges and opportunities which I'm going to focus on shortly because we have a task here right now. Um, I've introduced you all, um, but I think the audience would really love to hear around your particular forums and industries that you represent. So they have five minutes and I have my phone, so I'm going to time you <laughs> to present the relevant forums and what's pertinent, what's their focus, and potentially what their inflection points are. So I will start with Peter. Oh, sure. Uh, tēnā koutou, koutou. Um, uh, Brendan O'Connell, toko ingoa. Uh, really uh, good to be with you here this evening. And I am the Chief Executive of Agritech New Zealand. And so Agritech New Zealand is the industry association that um, connects, promotes and advocates for all of the interests around Agritech in and from New Zealand. You can imagine as a sector uh, in uh, in New Zealand, coming from the strength of our primary industries, um, um, there's nothing more primary in New Zealand than our, uh, our both our ag agricultural produce, um, how about we, how we go about producing it, uh, and the footprint that we do in doing that, and how we take it to the world. So where Agritech really comes to bear is obviously in helping our growers and farmers here in New Zealand to do the job that they do, uh, to adapt to the circumstances um, that they need to adapt to. And everything that we learn in doing that, of course, um, has created an industry in agri-tech um, that is creating great exports for New Zealand because the skills that we learn in that space is what we're able to take out to growers and farmers around the world. So as a sector, we stand at uh, 1.6 billion in revenues um, with an agri-tech industry transformation plan that's focused on growing those revenues to 8 billion by 2030. And the way we see doing that is to connect up those activities of how we do uh, good growing and productive practice here in New Zealand uh, and how we take some of those skills to the world as well. So in terms of the challenges that we've got and the opportunities we've got and, and why we see a discussion around what a digital nation means, we face the same uh, challenges as many other, uh, as many other sectors do. Um, we're seeing a digital transformation uh, happening on our farms and across our supply chains. Um, we're involved in discussions around uh, data interoperability, which um, most of the time ends up being discussions about human interoperability and this concept of trust. Uh, and so um, we're involved in many of the programs that are involved in developing, uh, in developing trust and digital capabilities in that space. Um, of course, we have some pretty unique challenges here as well. There are there are challenges in terms of uh, um, environmental impact and climate impact, uh, and many of the tools and services required to address those things, both here and both how and how we learn to do it here and take it to the world, are involving digital technologies, being able to uh, to report, being able to uh, being able to measure, and being able to bring that to um, to bear in many of the decisions that are made from a policy perspective uh, and from a global positioning for New Zealand as a country. Again, both in terms of our, our food and produce, but also in the methods we use and the footprints we make in food and produce and how we can take that, how we can take that to the world. Um, so I'm sure we're going to cover lots of other topics and we'll uncover even more interconnections, but those are, those are some. The one, the one thing I, I would mention is, you know, I mean, because agriculture is so 
uh, definitive here in New Zealand. You know, some of the largest databases here um, that have been growing for more than 50 years include things like our genetic improvement databases. And so, you know, it's already a sector that is strongly digitally driven. Um, it's gained uh, its, its place in the world through strong, strong digital tools. Uh, and yet we're coming across shared problems when we look at and shared opportunities when we talk to other sectors around what happens in this, in this uh, digital transformations. You actually have two more minutes if you want to keep going, but I'm happy to take the microphone from you. <laughs> I think we'll use the time when we can. Uh, Excellent. Um, kia ora. Thank you, Brendan. And actually, if you didn't, if you can't tell, Brendan's hugely passionate around the industry and has been a excellent advocate for agritech and what they're doing um, and i think that reflects really well um so actually i'm going to pass it over to allison allison if you could uh hear about blockchain i also might just cover off a little bit because five minutes you've got an, yeah well you've got seven minutes right now so I, okay. <laughs> i'm the kid at nz tech that does a lot of things a lot of different things but they all kind of intersect with each other and i think that's one of the wonderful things about leading so many of the organizations. So just to cover off again, I'm Alison Mackey, Executive Director of Blockchain New Zealand, IoT Alliance, Location Tech and EdTech. So I just want to give a little bit of love to EdTech at the moment because without education underpinning all of this, we would be nowhere. So I think that's one of the critical things that I always like to talk about is that education is key. And that doesn't necessarily mean our, our school children, it's education throughout your life to become lifelong learners. So we need to start thinking about things like micro credentials and looking at how do we upskill our current staff so that they're prepared for things like AI taking over or blockchain. It's a nice segue into my next topic of conversation, which is blockchain. So currently this ecosystem has completely flourished and dipped and flourished again and dipped. Um, it's currently we're in a bear cycle and that's fine financially. Um, but one of the great things that I've seen over the past year, year and a half that I've been in this job is that even though we've been in a bear cycle, we've faced a lot of economic uncertainty, the number of Web3 and blockchain companies that are coming out of New Zealand that are hitting incredible revenue numbers is something we should all be taking notice of for the economic impact. So that's a little bit of something there. Um, but yeah, I think to start, does everyone understand what Web3 is? Yeah. Good. Okay. For those that don't know, um, back in the 90s, so 1990 um, to about 2004, we hit the internet of Web 1, so that was read only. Then with the likes of Google and YouTube and things like that, thank you for hosting us today, guys. <laughs> um, we came about with read write internet, which brought out e-commerce. Fantastic. What's the issue with that? Data is being housed by one network or one platform. So now with the introduction of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, digital assets that are decentralized and distributed, um, we're coming into an age of Web3, which is read, write, and own. So now we're moving into this new era of the internet where we're starting to have ownership of what we put online. Where do we house our money? Where do we hold our assets? So I think that's something that's really interesting and kind of intersects a lot more than just cryptocurrencies. Um, gosh, what are opportunities and challenges? We have a lot of challenges at the moment. Let's start off with some bad things. We have a lot of issues in New Zealand at the moment when it comes to the regulatory frameworks. Um, currently, every different <laughs> government agency has a different idea of what's happening in the space. They don't quite know how to regulate things or communicate that to the industry. So that's where people like myself and my wonderful friends at Blockchain New Zealand come in and become that portal between industry and government. Um, there are issues with debanking because cryptocurrencies and blockchain in the past have, or well, still do have this negative connotation of being scams or I like to think misunderstood and bad investments, and that's on the owner of the crypto. Um, and so there's, you know, that issue of this industry is projected to be, I think, what did I write down? $3.1 trillion in revenue in 2030 for New Zealand. That's huge. And our companies can't get bank accounts because they're scams. So that's something that we are trying to work with with the banks at the moment. Um, yeah, and then going back to skills and education, it's just understanding that um, 
it doesn't take a lot to learn how to write blockchain code or anything like that, understand how that integrates into a current economic, economic or business system. So I think that's like a key part of what I do at Blockchain New Zealand is try to educate the mm. real use cases of blockchain, that it intersects more than just finance, it intersects the supply chain to help agriculture, helps AI to make sense of data, helps environmental issues with collecting data, distrib distributing data. It's it's it will take more than five minutes to explain everything but excellent and that's actually really good timing because our five minutes is up but i just want to say that i love how the youth of today love to divert and take control so not only did we cover blockchain but we covered edtech um so thank you Alison. and i hand over to jason uh, kia ora koutou, uh, uh, lovely to uh, host this. Thank you tonight for Google. And I'm sort of sitting here between some some real loving supporters and competitors. So on my left, we have the agritech sector. And right now I'm on a binge to say that the fintech sector is leading over the wine sector. Now, this is a challenge, right? So my big push is to say fintech at the moment is generating more wealth for New Zealand in the entire wine sector. Can you believe it? We're sitting here Hang on. Wine. I'm going to stop you there. Can people hear at the back? Can you hear? Can, hear? Okay. can you, is the microphone turned on? Yes, it is. And can you repeat that last sentence? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get in real trouble here, right? Because some of you got glasses of wine. But the fintech community, the sector in New Zealand, this is just fintech companies, this isn't banks, are generating more wealth for New Zealand than the entire wine industry. So based on our exporting revenue of 1.8 billion, this is last, uh, 21 data, growing at 25% up to 30% a year, currently we're exp exporting more. Now the point I'm trying to make here, isn't that wine is, actually I love wine, I, I, I get cracked. <laughs> so the good thing is, is that wine is awesome, but FinTech is awesome, and what's important about FinTech is it's a fast growing, scalable, weightless, exportable commodity, generating high value wealth and taxable income for New Zealand, much of which comes back to us rather than getting lost through our middlemen and our retailers and so on. So the point is, is that it's an awesome sector to focus on. So that's my little starter, okay? I think that too, but for very different reasons than I like the wine industry. Right. <laughs> okay, so I'm getting distracted. So, so the, the point I guess I wanted to make is that FinTech is an exciting place and it's doing great stuff, but we do actually have some pretty hefty challenges. So one of them is actually about equity for all New Zealanders to have access to the financial ecosystem, whether that be running an app online and being able to, to make a transaction or a purchase, maybe onboarding with a mortgage that's better value, maybe the ability for new and diverse services to consume data and transactional opportunity to work with other providers to bring new services and opportunities. So one of the big things that we do have to think about is diversity, access, competition. Now what's happening behind the scenes is that we have some really important legislative activity happening around the world. So think open banking, consumer data right. So internationally, uh, the world has been really embracing concepts of open data, which is basically a customer being able to share their data and being able to say, let me see, I want to transfer my mortgage from this bank to that bank with ease, without all of the encumbrances that go with it. It's actually really, really hard to do. Or maybe I want to spin up a, let's say, a zero application that does my HR, that makes a direct payment to my team member all seamlessly if I've got enough money in the bank account. So lots of things like that. Now, what we want in New Zealand is the opportunity around regulation to be better. So we've got, for example, consumer data right coming through legislation at the moment, very slow, but it's gonna really bring some opportunities like we've seen internationally. We have the identity framework, which is actually also going through, oh, sorry, gone through legislation and coming into law, which will help that process of helping people on board and getting better customer retention. Uh, we've also got other issues around privacy of information, mm. portability of information. These are all really big issues. And with respect to AI and blockchain, they're all adding value, but they also bring risks. And that's one of the big challenges for any owner of data, whether it be 
um, the actual owner, like myself, for example, a customer, or whether it be a provider like a data centre or a government agency. We really have to think a lot about that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting distracted here. Uh, <laughs> how am I doing for time? You've got a minute or so. We've got one minute left, okay. Good. So there's a few other things I want to tell you about. So one of the, one of the big areas is around sustainability. Now, you could say uh, a lot of our organisations greenwash. They, you know, make things look really awesome. But actually, sustainability is hugely impactful. Mm. Financial services, if we can analyse the data, um, show impact, and actually demonstrate value, then that's a huge exportable commodity. And uh, at the moment, we have some great Kiwi companies uh, putting frameworks around data, um, how data is uh, uh, carbon is sequestered, and then it's um, measured, and that also provides opportunity overseas. Now, of course, with cows and sheep and everything, who knows what methane is able to be done, but there are certainly frameworks coming. So the whole area of sustainability is growing as well. And also in the background, things like RegTech. I bet you never heard of RegTech, Regulation Tech. It's about helping government agencies and regulators and also uh, companies that have to do reporting on their financial information, share that in a technically uh, efficient way. So we have front-end experience, consumers, great experience, able to do things digitally with safe, secure data. At the back end, we have government agencies, uh, regulators, um, uh, other organisations that need to be a part of the back end framework to be more efficient and uh, more uh, better value. It's probably enough for me, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. I actually feel like I'm going to have to bring out the linesman to help with the refereeing that's going to have to go on here right now. But just so we're clear of the sides that I'm standing on, I've saved the best industry forum for last. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I'd like to hand over to Madeline, Chair of the AI Forum New Zealand. No favouritism at all. None at all. None at all. And and I have to, I have to thank um, all of my Executive Council members that are here today. There's quite a few of you. Um, oh, Talk louder. You. Talk louder. Talk louder. Says, they need to hear us. I know. Yeah. Okay. okay so uh, uh, that that is a great advantage. Thank you guys for being here. Um, there's quite a few of you here. Um, that also means that I can't make any mistakes because they'll pull me up on it later. <laughs> so the purpose of the AI forum, here we go, is to harness the power of AI for a prosperous, inclusive, and equitable Aotearoa. Now, no, no small task there. Um, when I joined about 12 months ago, um, lots of people wanted to talk about AI, but then six months ago, suddenly everyone wanted to talk about AI, and now it's incredibly, incredibly busy. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity, though, for New Zealand. Um, from a productivity perspective, we lag drastically. So we have some, some major productivity issues where um, less than 50%, um, so productivity per capita at less than 50% than Denmark and the US. We're 30% um, behind the UK and they think they're bad. And worst of all, we're 20% behind Australia and nobody likes to lose to Australia. Just, I mean, no offence, <laughs> Australia. Um, now, AI is something that can help us um, to address that productivity gap. And I think it's um, it's becoming more and more um, evident uh, yeah, ar ar around that. Um, you can do lots of things. So um, there's things like better resource allocation. So using our data to create um, to create a microphone that works. No, um, <laughs> go on. <laughs> using our data to um, to find better ways to allocate our, our very limited resources. So we heard a little bit about environmental impacts and things like that. So if we have very limited time and very, very few resources, why don't we use all of the tools at our, at our um, fingertips to make the best allocations of, of those very limited things so that we can have the best outcome for New Zealand? Um, and there's also, um, and then that's and that's from um, both a governmental perspective, local and and central government. Um, at the moment, we know that um, our data pools are not not the best, um, and there's work going on in the background to to bring those together. But let's just do a better job. And to your point about um, about sustainability, again, let's use um, our our predictive capabilities and and great resources like Google and Microsoft and everybody else to to um, to really help us to focus our efforts in the right places to make them make the maximum impact. And also from business perspective, 
I hear a lot about, um, and I listen, to, I listen to my members, or at least I try to, and I hear a lot about um, different businesses having various challenges. So not using the data that they have at their, at their, um, at their fingertips. So, for example, if you're in, um, it doesn't matter whether you're in, in agricultural, manufacturing, or wherever you might be, not using that data for the best, um, to the best of your ability. So, um, in a factory, not using the a simple example. In a factory, not using the um, the data that your machinery produces to do predictive maintenance means that when it breaks down, your whole production line stops. And that's not good for anyone. It's not good for your business. It's not good for um, your employees, and it's not good for you. Um, and it's not good for us as consumers either. Um, yeah, uh, risks. There's a, there's quite a few risks around around um, AI. So we've got there's not only the, the the common risks that we talk about are things like biases, um, biases and data and things like that. And um, I'm not going to carry on about that too much. But um, poor we've seen we see some examples of poor AI and some examples of good AI um, uh, from that perspective. And there are also there's also the risk of bad actors out there and things that don't add to New Zealand society. So. I guess at the end of the day, one of the things that, that we advocate for the most is for New Zealand to create its own AI strategy, to, to grasp the opportunity that's laid before us with all these developments in AI as they are. Um, because the big, big question for us is, do we want to drive our own results, our own society for the betterment of New Zealand, or do we want to have it happen to us? Because it's happening anyway. The mm -hmm. genie's out of the box. Excellent. Thank you, Adeline. And finally, we're going to hand over because with, none of this is possible without cloud and data. So we've got all dear love here to talk to us about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Kia ora. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, looking at the panel and certainly chatting to Madeline before the event started, I'm feeling a little bit outgunned by this panel. Uh, Madeline was telling a story about She's got three presentations this week. Uh, this is obviously one of them. The other one, uh, one of the other ones is to is to NASA, as you do, you present AI to NASA. So uh, looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that story. But welcome everyone. Thank you very much for making the time to come to us this evening. There's quite a lot happening in technology at the moment. A few headlines, and it is really an exciting place to be. I think from Google's perspective, uh, we feel like we're at the center of that universe. A lot is happening in our world and around our world. And we feel like it's an exciting place for us to be over the next year, mm -hmm. multiple years, hopefully. Uh, but in New Zealand, I think that takes us back to our purpose in New Zealand. And our fundamental purpose here, and when we launched our presence here in 2007, it hasn't changed since then. Technology is moving faster, but we are here to support the consumers and enterprises of New Zealand with their skills and their technology platforms. Ultimately, from a Google Cloud perspective and from a Google perspective, that is what we are here to do. And I think if you look at who we engage with, and Alison, I love the fact that you raised EdTech, really keen to, to talk a little bit about that. But we work at the big end of town. So the foodstuffs, the NZMEs, uh, we support startups. So the Parkables and the Kamis. And Kami is a really interesting story. So four and a half thousand percent growth over the past three years. What a phenomenal story for New Zealand. 180 countries, 37 million members on that platform. So for Google to have even supported a little bit of that growth, that's, that's enormously exciting for us and something that we're proud of. Uh, we're also proud of the offices that you see around you. So in 2021, as Caro mentioned before, we moved into these offices. And if you haven't had a tour, uh, I promise you it is worth your time. The little nuances, the little details that you'll find through here, both for the local community, for Google, and for Aotearoa as a, as a country, it is, it's a really special place for us. Uh, so 2021, we came into these offices. 2021 was also a big year for us because we launched our local engineering presence. So coming back to developing the skills, which I'm sure we're going to hear about on this panel, developing the skills in New Zealand, bringing an engineering presence to New Zealand is something that we're enormously proud of. And in 2022, we announced our region. So Google is bringing and investing in a cloud region for New Zealand. Hugely, hugely exciting. So when we think about those big customers I mentioned before, the startups, uh, it's also 
the ed techs. It's those teachers that are using Google Workspace and Google for Education and Chromebooks to educate the students and the talents of the future that are going to work in all of our industries and all of your industries. That's also something that we're phenomenally proud of. So uh, I'm going to get out of the way and get back to the panel. I think that's less than five minutes, but we are really, really proud to be supporting Kiwis, consumers and enterprises with digital skills and digital technology. And, uh, and we do want to talk a little bit about startups, but I'll leave that for a little bit later. Rhoda, thank you, Paul, and I do want to acknowledge Google for having us here tonight. Um, it, it is a, actually a beautiful office, um, and I'll take you up on that tour too. Um, excellent. Thank you, and thank you for the summary of all those amazing industry tech associations that are actually doing some really great stuff, and I get to evidence the activity that is happening um, kind of real time, and I'm incredibly proud to be part of them as, as we really do try to focus on Aotearoa and what we can be doing from the tech industry. And the good news, Alison, as you were talking about regulation earlier, there's going to be a minister here later. So uh, please take that opportunity to um, to speak. And I think that's something for all our room to, to focus on. The other thing I just want to point out is we are waiting for the minister to turn up and it could be half an hour, it could be longer. So there's going to be ample of opportunity for questions. So please do, if you've got any burning questions, um, put your hand up even while I'm chatting because I'm happy to come out to the audience and, and have questions as we go along to make this quite an interactive conversation. Um, but to kick things off, um, New Zealand is a digital economy. We are a digital economy. How are we benchmark against the other OECD countries though? Um, and I'd just really like to run along the panel to think from your particular associations, how are we doing against the rest of the world? That's a big question. Um, I think for blockchain specifically, sorry, oh, I know I'm terrible. I think for blockchain specifically, um, I think that we used to be very fast at adopting things, especially in the finance phase, but somehow with blockchain and crypto and all that sort of stuff, we, I feel like we're trailing behind the slugs a little bit. Um, and I feel like we often have to look at Australia and Singapore and seeing what they're doing before we even think about approaching the subject. And so that's something that I think myself and the team at Blockchain NZ are really kind of keen on starting to have a lot louder conversations to say that there is a huge opportunity here for our economy with Web3 and gaming and blockchain dis like distributed technology in general to create huge economic impact. Because we saw during COVID, I'm so sorry, Brendan, but supply chain failed. And now with climate change, floods, all these. <laughs> well, you. <laughs> I know, but it's agriculture, darling. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, we can't rely on that. It's, it's subject to too many things. And tourism as well. It's low skilled, it's low wage. And it's, um, you know, people come over here to work in tourism and then they leave. So, how do we not only keep our kids here because web3 and game development all that cool stuff is kind of targeted at my generation how do we keep them here how do we upskill people already but how do you also retain people like me because that's a huge issue that i'm seeing mm. excellent um a couple of things so i said six months ago it was really difficult to get people engaged not hugely difficult but a lot more difficult than it is now now AI is all over the place and everybody everybody wants to run to it. And that's got some good things and some bad things about it. Some of the good things are that um, it's much easier to, to talk to people about it, much, uh, much better for adoption. And we're getting a lot more interest from across the spectrum. So it's not, it used to be just technologists and people who were really keen on policy things and things like that. Now it's everybody's an expert in AI. Of course, that brings back the, some of the downsides there because they're not actually experts in AI, though they are using it a lot. Hmm. potentially um but the some of the good things about it so we are really good at this stuff we are amazingly good our um in our academic sector we have some of the best academics in the world working in this space there's um there's a few in the room um and we we are truly good at this stuff you just just think about some of the companies that you can you can list off that are new zealand companies soul machines unique um, frankly, AI. Frankly, AI are one of the first com companies in the world to make commercial use of ChatGPT, and they did it in Maori and uh, Pacifica languages. Um, we have, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, 
yeah, some of the some of the work that's going on in our universities is just absolutely phenomenally groundbreaking. We're really good at this stuff. Let's not hide our light under a bushel. Let's adopt it. <laughs> okay, I'll carry on. Um, I, I don't want to get. I don't want to get down on how we're doing against the rest of the world. I think, but with a financial services lens, and we're talking insurance, banking, wealth, investment, a whole suite of environments, payments, and so on. Uh, actually, you could say that we're behind. But if you look back at New Zealand's history in the 80s and the early 90s, we did phenomenally well in changing the whole way we engage. Other countries still use checkbooks. In the 1980s, we had inter interconnected bank accounts, we had FPOS, and within literally a year or two, most New Zealanders had made a nice seamless transition. It was called right fit, right time, right space, and a peculiar uh, element, which is New Zealand's small country and the ability for technologies to all come together and be embraced and supported by regulation and innovation. So I would argue at the moment with an open banking lens, this is the innovation lens, that we're behind the rest of the world. Other countries are doing really well. They've got good investment and have got scale and so on. And they've got government infrastructure to help. New Zealand is behind, but we have the advantage of learning from what's done well overseas and what's not done so well. And with our intimate, we all know each other kind of background, we actually have the opportunity to right size, right shape and scale at pace. Mm. And that would be my argument that the enablement of data, AI, working with other colleagues across the sector and the support of the government to get the right framework for regulation means we can actually do really well. It's quite interesting in the UK they have a have an organisation called Open Banking which is openbanking.org.uk which is their UK government environment for all open banking organisations to register on the framework. It's bookmarked by two great Kiwi companies. One of them is nine spokes as in before the number A and the other one at the other end is zero. So you've got great Kiwi companies <laughs> building good solutions for a mid-market environment. That mid-market environment is worldwide. We can do the same. And I think if we embrace innovation, technology, working together, we can really do some awesome stuff. So I'll, I'll pass over to my learned friend, Brendan. <laughs> Thanks, Jace. Um, a, a couple of points. I mean, I think um, we, we're talking about education and ed tech, and I know when I was speaking to my own kids around education comparisons and how you're doing compared to other kids, it's not a healthy. It's not a healthy comparison to make. You're all, you're you're going to make far better uh, insights and learnings if you're comparing yourself to your previous self and to the objectives you've got and how you want to grow, rather than trying to compare yourself to others. But if we are going to do some comparisons in an OECD uh, context. In an agricultural perspective, um, you'll hear people from the sector talking about New Zealand's primary industries have been built, um, you know, without subsidies or support. Um, that approach has given New Zealand primary practice um, a great start in terms of um, how it goes about transacting its businesses, what, um, what level of professionalism there is on farms, and what that has meant in terms of digital adoption. Um, we completed some research last week around the levels of digital adoption across all of the primary industries. Uh, and when it comes to basic practices in terms of business management and uh, and the like, there was a very high level of adoption, a higher level of adoption than I think you will find in many other similar uh, um, similar economies within their primary industry, within their primary um, uh, within their primary sector. So there were some things to celebrate: 70% adoption across business management tools across New Zealand farms, uh, farmers and growers. Um, so there's some good good points that I'm out there. Again, from an OECD comparison point of view, uh, um, one of the, the one of the comparisons that most interests me is that sort of income per capita and a productivity measure and what that actually means. And much as I support what happens in uh, in in our own industries here in agriculture in terms of food and beverage, um, the greater value we can get from that without increasing volume, um, the reputation it gives New Zealand, I know that there is even greater progress that's going to come from our digital technologies and what we can do because they're constrained by different things. They're not constrained uh, by the uh, by the same footprints and by the same levels of emissions. And so I see great when I look at you know the our. Uh, uh, 
um, our comparisons from an OECD point of view, um, I agree with Jace that actually it is going to be our technology-driven industries that are less constrained uh, and have a more abundant approach with a different set of constraints around them from a uh, um, from a climate impact perspective um, that I think gives great um, great opportunity mm. for New Zealand. Thank you. And Paul from Cloud and Data, how are we doing here compared to the rest of our OECD? Yeah, I think we're doing pretty well. I think there are a number of elements that that support this. And if you look at the the foundation stones, if you like, that make this up. So the first is is the the um, the regulation framework, and we've touched on regulation here at the moment. In a lot of ways, New Zealand has a very advanced thinking around legislation and youth sustainability as an area. I would say in the OECD, a very advanced in terms of the thinking and the drive towards a sustainable future. Uh, the other element is is risk taking and a willingness to take risk. Mm. I think New Zealand has that. I think there are, uh, I mean, look at bungee jumping and jet boating and all sorts of things that that Kiwis invented. There is an appetite to take risk, but uh, I joke a little bit. But low levels of corruption, stable environment. There are a lot of things around entrepreneurs that are support networks that will allow them to then go and take those risks. And the third element then is is the skill base, and what are we doing, I think, as as an organization to help develop those skills? We've touched a little bit about on how we're supporting the, the schools and the universities and how involved Google is in those. But it's giving those entrepreneurs and those budding startups and the both the capability to do that, whether that be financial, whether that be business capability, or whether that be technical capability. I think those are the three elements that Certainly when we support startups, those are the three elements that we think about. It's giving them the capabilities to then grow and start a business in a relatively safe test bed. Mm -hmm. The next step, the ability to then go global or go regional to take them to the next level, that I think is where uh, the government and some legislation needs to, needs to support those entrepreneurs because New Zealand is a relative to the OECD countries, a relatively small market. The ability to get into the US and into Europe and others, that's where New Zealand companies turn into global behemoths. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point, actually. And it's a really good segue into the next question that I have here. And um, we've mentioned strategy or lack of for, for some of our industries um, and regulation. So um, how can our digital strategy for Aotearoa and the digi digi digital industry transformation plan shift the dial for each of our particular technology or, or fields? And I'm going to start with fintech, actually. So, Jason, I'm going to, we're going to give you the mic. You give me the really hard one, haven't you? I have. Give me the question again. <laughs> so we've got we've got a digital strategy and the digital yeah. industry transformation plan. How can how can we leverage it to shift the dial in fintech? Right, that's a real hard one. Okay, so education really matters. I think we've covered that. We all know that um, more digitally enabled people particularly our, uh, our rangatahi coming through, they bring massive change and then the ability for uh, others across society to get involved. If you look at the Digital uh, Industry Transformation Plan, if you look on the website at the moment, it has one page of, we'd like to do this, not much else really, to be honest, um, and that's because it's about to be announced. And the Digital uh, Implementation Plan is really going to the spirit of communities working together. It's the ability to embrace technology, embrace the skills, build capability and capacity across the sector, and with a fintech lens, to bring that through into uh, the various environments that we have that we want to play. Uh, but we're not alone. We're not in isolation. Uh, whilst financial services is obviously um, really impactful, we can't do that without education. We can't do that without the support of governments and regulation. We can't do it without investment. We can't do it without um, an economy that is supported to to really help that happen. And, you know, whether thinking of the export lens, which is so important to uh, fintech, uh, the likes of NDT, Callahan Investment, um, all of the other government agencies, um, say startup programs and so on, they all help us build capability. And if the ITP, the transformation plan, helps us with that, then that's a really important thing. But I think ultimately it's around togetherness and, and, and the mahi of coming together. That's what we need to really embrace. Mm, excellent. Um, Brendan, I know that there's a lot in the agri sector and, and that you've been focused on from that perspective. 
Yeah. Look, David Bans over here in, invented the three letters ITP um, <laughs> many many years ago. He won't accept responsibility for that. <laughs> but I guess there is a there is a perspective from the agritech sector, just simply in, in terms of specifically around the industry transformation um, plan and uh, as as uh, an opportunity for related interests to come together and look at, at look at how they can work together to grow a particular sector so agritech was the first of the uh, industry transformation uh, plans to be defined it was launched in july 2020 by david and the agencies that he was representing at that time and agritech new zealand was the industry partner that was helping that process so we have a little bit of a head start, um, which was both a blessing and a curse, because there's a couple of things that happened after July 2020 that made implementation of some of the plans a little bit difficult, as you can imagine. But when I think of what initiatives like that really mean, um, the language that we're now using two years on um, is, is what's the concept of a smart ecosystem. Um, so an ecosystem obviously is something that just exists, a room like this with various relationships as they sit and whatever, for whatever reasons. I guess a smart ecosystem is one that's not setting some shared goals and looking at collaborative practice together in terms of growing that sector. And we're seeing that happen more and more in the agri-tech sector. Um, and I think a lot of that has been because of the, the shared identity that we've got, that, um, that effectively there are shared interests here and we're all in it together, uh, and the shared aspirations about levels of, of growth and impact that we really want to that we really want to have when I look at agri-tech ecosystems overseas over the last four or five years and see how they're different from how things have been structured here in New Zealand it's been encouraging to see some transformations happen during that period in the agri-tech space so specifically in internationally when you're looking in um, uh, in any ecosystem but it's definitely the case in the agri-tech ecosystem so the use of technology within growing systems um, but there was a very large role played by um, large multinationals the bear crop science the BASFs, the cargills or the syngenters uh, and even New Zealand's large organizations are not large organizations often in a, in a, in a um, global scene. So we didn't have the same um, type of uh, contribution to the ecosystem at that point. Um, we are seeing uh, very different behaviors now from our large organizations. I guess another in the, in the agri space, uh, another factor around our large organizations be that they, they aren't as large as some of those other ecosystems and a big cooperative impact here as well. Those other cooperatives had a certain impact in the agri-tech space. A couple of years on and now we're seeing some very different behaviors. We're seeing some of our large organizations, our cooperatives such as Silver Fern Farms taking an active part in our uh, agri-tech accelerator environment, the um, startup environment with um, Sprout Agri-tech. Um, we're seeing one of our cooperatives in the fertilizer space setting up a venture fund called Ignition. Um, we're seeing our large privately owned businesses like Gallagher realizing that not all of their investments can be done, not all of their R&D can be done internally, so they're externalizing their R&D and doing active investments. And I think a lot of those type of changes is people sort of um, looking and behaving as sort of what is a smart ecosystem? How do we actually share the work in um, uh, in growing a sector together. Um, and that's what I think the industry transformation plans have enabled. I think we've only just started. We're in the agri-tech sense. We've, uh, we're just about to launch, um, we've just finished consultation and we'll launch the, uh, the next wave of work programs for the agri-tech ITP um, at our big industry event in, uh, in field days uh, next month. Um, but for me, it's a lot about, I mean, we, you know, we can start throwing around the word collaboration here and, and try and understand what that really means. But for me, it comes together as having some shared goals, some shared ambitions and starting to act as a smart ecosystem. And that's what I hope for the work that we will contribute to in the digital um, ITP as well. Mm, excellent. I'm going to come to you shortly, Paul, because I'm really interested to hear what an organisation like Google can play in that space. I mean, I picked up smart ecosystem, community, connection, um, but before we get to you, I just like Madeline, from an AI perspective and from our our forum, how's the digital industry transformation plan playing out for us in the digital strategy? Um, at the moment, it's still in draft form, and we don't have um, any clear answers. But what I can say is that there's lots of stuff happening on the ground. So just because the digital IP ITP hasn't landed yet, and that may change today, and just because we don't have an AI strategy per se, doesn't mean that there's nothing happening on the ground. And there are, there are. and I, a big shout out to the guys at um, Callahan Innovation, mm. who are 
working tirelessly to give us practical examples and develop practical examples of how this stuff can be done. Um, and there's other areas within the economy as well. So, for example, health. We're, there's some really, really good stuff happening. And AI is one of those tool sets where it can be reused in different situations. And there's a really nice couple of examples um, out there of where things like um, uh, the same technology that you use to clean up film can be used to clean up um, an X-ray. So... Uh, there's a really good example of Sector, who's a, they're a startup run by an eminent um, radiologist because he wants to do better better work for the people that come to see him, so for his patients. He's not trying to replace himself. We just simply don't have enough radiologists in New Zealand. Um, and he wants to make better decisions faster for people. Um, so he's using AI to help him clean up and identify um, cases that he needs to look at. Um, so you get your yes, no answer much quicker. Um, is there something to worry about or not? No or yes. And if yes, then you get to see somebody faster. And from a health perspective, if you're sitting on a waiting list, that's really important. And I think there's lots of really practical examples like that that um, that are happening in the background anyway. And it's organisations like Callaghan, like Precision Driven Health, that have helped things like that that to happen. Um, and um, and helping to make our, I guess, our specialists superhuman. Uh, there are other ITPs out there, in the, in the whether they're, um, uh, you know, there's, I know there's construction and forestry, and they're all coming to the fore, and they're starting, they're, we're starting to deliver things off the back of those. Um, and I always like to think of it as, um, oh, I guess my partner said this when we when we came back to New Zealand after 20 years away, and he was like, oh, New Zealand's four to five years behind everyone else. And then he was like, ah, oh, New Zealand's four to five years behind everyone else. So there's a lot of opportunity in looking at what's happened elsewhere and taking the best of it and not maybe maybe not making all the same mistakes. Excellent. Um, Alison? Yes. And actually, actually, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to come to the audience. So please get yourselves ready after this. What happened at my rearing for this question? You can pick Whatever one. one I pick want. one, yes, go. Mm -hmm. Blockchain isn't really well understood for the ITP. Um, it could fit. I could try and make it fit, but it's not understood yet. Um, <laughs> uh, IoT, though, the idea of Industry 4.0 it hits so many different things. Of you know, IoT is this beautiful data collection point. And what do we need to do with this absolute data swamp that IoT creates? It needs AI to make sense of the data so that we can make right. great decisions and do a better job at having productivity, I guess. So I think that's something that we've been kind of dipping our toes in. Not all the time. We're not as big as Agritech. We don't get our own plan. Um, but we do intersect across the board with IoT. In terms of EdTech, obviously, um, we don't have a whole industry transformation plan, but um, we've been working with the Minister of Education on the digital strategy refresh, which should be ready for launch very soon. I'm very excited about that. And that's kind of diving into the entire curriculum and how do we uplift digital um, equity, digital skills, digital understanding, not just for our students, but again, for all all of us. Excellent. So we're very excited about that, yeah. Thank you, great. Oh, what's Google doing for us? <laughs> well, firstly, Who'd be a regulator? I mean, you can't please everybody. There are so many different industries you need to please. It's, it's like being a rugby league referee and, and CEOs of telcos telling you that you're, you're not doing the right thing. But it's really tough space. So regulating all these different industries and finding the right framework is hard. Uh, Google did a bit of work with one of our partners and released our economic um, impact report. And this, this showed that if... Uh, if digital transformation is done right, it can create up to $46 billion in annual economic savings by 2030. That's a big number, $46 billion. And you think about the building blocks that, that Google and, and data and others provide, that's mobile internet, that's cloud computing, that's IoT, that's AI, that's all the things that Google, uh, we do reasonably well and we're trying to bring to, to the consumers and to the enterprises of New Zealand. Uh, there is one other thing that, that in terms of the way that we're working with government, so some of you may be aware, has anyone heard of Checkable? Digital Boost Alliance? Hands up, Checkable, anyone? Okay, geez, not very many hands. So any small business owners? Anyone know anyone that runs a small business? Okay, so 
MB, uh, in association with the Digital Boost Alliance, have built a tool called Checkable, and that's in conjunction with us. And Checkable is basically a digital health check. So you can see what your digital presence looks like, and it'll give you an action plan based on you know, Google properties and otherwise for you to increase your digital presence. So I look at that and think all the small and medium enterprises across New Zealand have access to a free tool, this free checkable tool, where they can at least go and see what digital presence looks like. Mm. And as we know, and COVID proved, digital presence is so, so important, and it's still going to remain important. So it's a big space for us. Uh, I do sympathize with the regulators, but there's a lot of technology that can support this. Excellent. Good. And actually, so one one final question from me. Um, our minister's not too far away. So um, we've sat here and we've drawn on or compared. I've asked you to compare how we're doing on a on, from a global perspective. But I'm really keen to understand what we're all doing from an association and organisation perspective and drawing on our own unique country point of view. So what are your associations doing to reflect or address te ao Māori or our te ao Māori perspective on things around making your organisations and us unique on a global platform? Can I start with Ed? Yes, go. Because of course EdTech just is just the best let's agree to that um so our purpose thanks shane yep um <laughs> our previous chair um edtech is all about our overarching purpose is to bring awareness to educational technology and underneath that we have um oh no it's not awareness is only part of it equity is our overarching purpose <laughs> and underneath that is export and um awareness and so it's awareness of these educational technologies um, and from an equitable perspective. And so we lead up a lot of Te Reo Māori activities with that, um, as well as export, because there's a little bit of an issue in New Zealand with the Ministry of Education and procurement and allowing our products and services into our own classrooms. That's a different topic of conversation. However, a lot of our products here are catered to our students. And I think that that's... One of the special things about us as a country is that we, our children are special. We're built up in a very special culture where it's bicultural, multicultural, however you want to place it. It allows all children to kind of be seen in their, their own place in the world. And I think that that's something really special that EdTech products and services or education technology in general allows that. And to have that be able to be exported to the world where other children can then have their own culture implemented into a learning activity, I think is really special. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you, Alison. Madeline, what are we doing from an AR forum perspective? Um, we do really well, I think, <laughs> Megan. <laughs> um, we're very privileged to have Megan as our chair, um, a fantastic uh, role model for all New Zealand Maori women, especially. Um, kia ora. Um, we have Te Ao Māori as an underpin, underpinning stripe across all of the things that we do. So recently, we um, in the last uh, in the last six months or so, we've convened a Kahui Māori, um, and that, that's enabled us to start talking about the things to do with AI that we previously might have avoided talking about because we wanted to give a balanced view. I'm not Māori. I don't want to speak on behalf of somebody that I'm not, um, and it's very important that we now have that we now have that voice and there are people there that I can go to when I get asked difficult questions and we can give a good answer. Um, we can give a well-considered answer um, and we're very, very grateful um, to the people on that panel. And um, The other thing I'd like to talk about is that um, today, earlier today, I was chatting to um, some of the students at the Media Design School uh, about the AI Forum and the importance of growing the community, and this goes back to um, some, of the, some of the points made earlier, if your community of technologists does not reflect your community, your technology will never fit. It will only ever fit 90% of the people, 90% of the time. And with the personalization that AI allows you to have now, there is no excuse for that at all. There's no excuse for financial services to exclude people. There is no excuse for and um, whatever product it is that you're producing to exclude people, there is an answer now, and inclusivity has to be a part of that. Excellent, thanks. Um, yeah, um, 
Uh, I, I would add that uh, diversity is absolutely essential. If you look at the financial services, which is so impactful for every person on the planet, if we're not having services designed for supporting their customers, ultimately you're not going to get best value. And New Zealand, like so many countries in the world, struggles with uh, a lack of inclusion, exclusion, and a lack of uh, suitability. So I know from a fintech NZ perspective, we're on a on an internal journey for like to 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 find better ways to engage with all of those across our community. Uh, if I if I look at the Mahitahi concept of uh, working to better together and diversity and inclusion, one of the big messages would be is that we need um, services and products designed by communities or designed by the people from anywhere to get the right fit for themselves and to support that in its growth out, 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 outwards. And, and I know for us, when we did the research project uh, the year before last uh, on diversity and inclusion of financial services, it was really clear that we need to do work, uh, a lot more work around inclusion, particularly for Māori and Pacifica, and, and that's one of our important goals. Mm. Uh, and behind that, uh, growth, access to export markets, and the ability to uh, get the right fit for our marketplace out to the world. So we get it diverse here, we can actually really help get access to a marketplace internationally. 100%. That's around building that unique product that, that we can Absolutely. we can take to the market. Brendan? I think when you're talking about whether it's a digital nation or you're just talking about an, a nation as a whole, you really need to understand some realities about yourself and some opportunities, and they include both strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, I look at New Zealand is always going to be small and New Zealand is always going to be isolated. Now, there's real advantages um, in that in terms of things that we can do here, things that we can trial and prove here. When it comes to uh, um, agri-tech, agriculture, how we grow food, and the Te Māori perspective and the real value that that brings, there's nothing more uh, than food production that needs the insights that come from um, an intergenerational view and a, and a holistic view to how you do go about doing that. And so I think Te Māori is a uh, a massive part of New Zealand's uniqueness and its and its um, opportunity both to do things well here um, and to take that to the world. Um, and so I think Te Māori is is fundamental from Agritech New Zealand's point of view. We're obviously working with. Maori landowners who are using technology and testing technologies in different way, and Maori innovators as well who are looking at those technologies themselves. So, a massively important part of New Zealand's both current reality and our future potential. Excellent. And Paul, from a Google perspective. No, I really like what Brendan said there. I think that uh, that wraps it up. I mean, from a Google perspective, we feel an enormous sense of responsibility. So, if you think about our platforms. Our platforms are the way that a lot of people will find information, will search for information, and the information that they get needs to be trusted. I mean, we talked about trust a little bit before. So there's an enormous sense of responsibility that we have to deliver trusted information and also to support uh, communities that might not have the same advantages as other communities. So both from a, from a Google perspective in the way that people search and, and gather information, but also from a cloud perspective. So bringing the region to New Zealand, that lets us address things like Maori data sovereignty mm -hmm. and, and other challenges about that that's, um, that community feels important to them. Uh, it's an area that I think everybody in New Zealand and all of our organizations can do better and will continue to do better. But I know we have a massive focus and you know, Cara is smiling there. There's a huge focus in our, in our business to, to do as much as we can in that area. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I know I promised you the opportunity to ask questions. However, the taxi from the airport to here wasn't as bad as we thought it may be. Um, and so we're very fortunate to have the minister in our midst. So, uh, tēnā tātanga, mahi nui ki a koutou mō tō tainga mai ki te whakawhiti kōrero i tēnei kaupapa nui nui. So, um, thank you to our panel um, for coming today to have a conversation, an important conversation around um, shaping our tomorrow, um, at, of which technology is really at the heart of it for us all. So, um, thank you very much to our panellists and thank you for your time. Thank you, Megan. That was awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, the team, thank you.
it's always nice to know what you do on your days. And, uh, and Paul, uh, thank you. It's good to hear some more from Google. I've, it's a great pleasure. I have the great pleasure of introducing the Honourable Jenny Anderson. Uh, in this sense, she's the Minister of the Digital Economy and Communication. She's also the Minister of plenty of other things. But today, we're focused on the digital economy. She's also the MP for Hutt South. And, uh, and I, we thank her very much for coming all the way after a busy morning in Cabinet and uh, getting all the way up here uh, to help us launch Tech Week. Mr Anderson, thank you. Kia ora koutou. can you hear me? All right. That's good, yeah. Uh, well, ko te mahi tua tahi ki te atua, nana nei ngā mea katoa. Ko te mahi tua roa ki te whare etu nei i tēnā koe. He mahi mahana ki a koutou katoa, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, hui hui mai tātou katoa. Kia ora, and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here again in an absolutely amazing building. I'm always blown away with how beautiful this building is. So a big thanks uh, to Google for hosting us. Um, look, I'd like to, as well as thanking Google, thank you, Graham, for the introduction. Very much appreciate that. And um, it's really exciting to be here when it's Tech Week. So well-timed. Uh, I'm really always fascinated to see what new ideas are showcased through Tech Week and the great opportunities it provides for greater networking within the New Zealand tech ecosystem and how we can work together stronger. Uh, and I can see this this week's program is jam packed full of great initiatives and different ideas to participate in. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, everyone in the room as well as those who are tuning in virtually. So I know we've got those online. So I'd uh, just like to acknowledge all of those, whether you're working in the sector, whether you're creating, whether you're sector, sector leader, no matter what your role is, it's great to have uh, the level of uptake and engagement in, in this week and as part of that. Uh, and I hope people are getting involved in the events. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to coordinate such a comprehensive program. So I hope you take full advantage of all that hard work that's gone in behind the scenes. Uh, really interesting to catch the end of tonight's panel discussion. Always keen to hear those questions being asked, particularly around diversity and uh, how we incorporate all the richness of Māori culture and uh, tangata whenua and how we continue to evolve. And in my view is that it's our cutting edge, it's our secret weapon in terms of if we can manage to integrate that uh, well in our skills and our technology and our development. Uh, a lot of that debate around um, how we shape up uh, data sovereignty in terms of a Māori perspective, a big way for me, I think, is just making sure we have a whole lot of young, talented Māori people employed in a whole range of different uh, creative industries right across New Zealand. Uh, and, um, and I'm always keen to have those conversations, how we can drive that further. Um, it's a sector that's contributed seven billion per annum towards New Zealand's GDP, and that's a big reason of, of why we have an ITP specific to this space. It holds so much potential uh, for doing exactly what our government wants to do, which is to drive a high wage, low emissions economy. It's critical to our future. Uh, it's also a sector where we might find answers to some of the challenges that we see in terms of climate change, health, education, economic pr productivity. And we want to make sure that we're positioned well enough to take full advantage of what's coming next on the horizon. This is a government that's committed to supporting you grow sustainably and also to thrive, to recognise the creativity in this industry and make sure that we're partnering to take full advantage of that. It recognises that to have those high wages, to move towards that high wage, low emissions economy, then we really need to tackle some of our productivity issues. And this means unleashing the innovative potential of creativity of our businesses and our people, many of here who are today building the skills of the future. And part of that, I, I, I believe that we, we want to make sure that whether it's a small business or a medium-sized business, that people have got that headroom to be able to create and be able to feel like they want to develop new content. And when I visit, uh, whether it's SAS or whether it's game development, uh, I see that because New Zealand's been through such a challenging time, along with many other uh, many other countries right across the world is that it is mental health is a really big factor that we want to continue to talk about and support. Uh, and it's always great to see workplaces that provide flexibility and support uh, to give those small businesses 
uh, the headroom to continue to be the creative edge that we know. Uh, now, as you know, uh, it is only three sleeps until the budget. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Grant Robertson says that. He always tells me it's only seven sleeps to go. We're down to three. So unfortunately, I'm not here today to make a pre-budget announcement. So we will have to wait until the budget. I'm quite excited about the budget, uh, but I do want to outline the framework and that we're working in because it's been a really challenging time. Uh, I, whenever you, um, I, I, I get fearful of mentioning COVID because I think it just triggers everybody's had some kind of really awful experience, whether it's a business, it's a family member separated. It's been it's been an awful time, not just for us, uh, but for uh, for the entire world and how we re rebuild and make sure we take advantage of the strong financial position we're in is critical to how we how we go forward. So this budget's going to strike a balance between supporting New Zealanders with those cost of living pressures that we know are being felt so sharply, while also charting a course for a more productive and resilient economy. No easy feat, right? Uh, you've got a bit of short-term and long-term going on at the same time. So this year's budget is a wellbeing budget. It's a six budget delivered under the wellbeing framework. Uh, and we're also wanting uh, to really make sure we do what this ITP will hopefully work towards, which is delivering a higher wage economy. So the budget's been put together of yet another challenging circumstances. Uh, the elevated inflation, which has been added on by the impact of cyclone floods early in the year. And it's seen uh, government having to uh, reach into um, our back, back pockets and provide significant support to those regions who have been directly impacted, uh, particularly up the East Coast. And just yesterday, you would have seen a, a $1 billion announcement in relation to uh, trains, schools, uh, all of the, the basic building of uh, mental health, as well as I've mentioned. So uh, we were kind of part way through the budget process and Cyclone Gabriel uh, hit the East Coast. So there's no additional costs that are going to be put upon uh, New Zealanders as a result of that. And so we've had to recalibrate what was the budget in order to be able to meet those rebuild needs, as well as still keeping our eye on the horizon. So the uh, the hundred million dollars, and as part of that one billion I, me I mentioned, is also on flood protection. So we're equipped to climate change and the continued challenges that we're going to be seeing. And this recovery package will get roads, rail, schools back to where they were before the extreme uh, weather event occurred. The Treasury estimates on on the cost of the cyclone is, is between sort of nine and fourteen billion. So it's looking at, at just below uh, where. Uh, you know, Christchurch's earthquake was the only other event we've seen. The Prime Minister has already indicated the ongoing cost of the recovery will be met within the budget, and um, this means we've put responding to the cyclone ahead of some of the other priorities that ministers have liked to focus on, and that's not been an easy discussion, I can tell you. So we do need to get the balance right, and there are challenging circumstances we need to face, cost of living, cyclone, but we also need to make sure uh, we are working and making sure we're making the most of, of what we have. And tonight I want to share a little bit of information around some of those specific initiatives that we've been working on. So you'll be aware that we already have the digital strategy for Aotearoa. This is really the framework in which the industry transformation plan sits within. So it's, it's a commitment and a strategy that has been shaped by hundreds of stakeholders to give us a framework to work with. It has vision and a plan to support people, communities, and economy and the environment to flourish and prosper and all of the opportunities that tech offers us. The second initiative is the Digital Technologies Industry Transformation Plan, which I'm really proud to formally come here and uh, launch tonight. The digital ITP uh, sits under that digital strategy and it's one of eight different ITPs uh, right across a range of sectors in New Zealand. The idea is, it, is it's not only a way of aligning the industry with itself, but it's also a framework for participation between government and industry. The digital ITP is the result of collaboration between the sector and government over the last few years. And I'd like to acknowledge hard work that's gone on on both government and industry sides to get us this far. Uh, it's, it's really designed to support sector growth the digital ITP is a long-term vehicle for partnership, 
so that we can make the most of technology and the tech sector in New Zealand. Accelerating the growth of the digital tech sector will help transform to having lower emissions and higher wages, as we aspire to do. But most importantly, it would also help raise the value of our exports and to make sure that we are more resilient in the face of the challenges that continue to come. The ITP includes actions that look to grow our weightless digital exports, build our national reputation and also make the most of innovation, the creativity that we have. And a big part of that is enhancing the pipeline of digital skills and talent in the tech sector and related industry to enrich Māori inclusion and in the activity of the sector through partnerships with Māori. And it also will be a focus on areas such as data-driven innovation, artificial intelligence, and I know there's a few experts here tonight on that, and also government procurement. These are all areas we need to continue to be talking about between government and industry and share our ideas. While finalising this plan, officials have been working closely uh, to, 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 get how, to get the implementation because a lot of the, the thinking is great, but we want to see what the framework is and how that rubber hits the road. Uh, with modest funding coming on stream in 2020 and more last year, there was an opportunity to get cracking even before the plan uh, kicked in. To date, government has committed 35 million in funding to a range of initiatives under the digital ITP that are already well underway. And a few of these are, uh, I'll just go through a couple of those. Early on, it was pretty clear that while New Zealand's technology experts continue to grow, the level of awareness about our strengths as a country and our capabilities was low. So it was important to be able to tell our story. Government has invested in telling our tech innovation th story through the See Tomorrow Marketing Initiative to build our reputation as a high-tech nation, attract investment and talent, and also to inspire the next generation. I think that's a particularly important area. We want to make sure that our young people who are already online see an opportunity in this space. And I worry sometimes when I visit local high schools or young people that there's a sort of a misperception that uh, that you have to be no machine code or be some kind of uh, super, super intelligent um, software engineer to be in the sector and I still think we've got a job to do to tell that story that this is a creative industry, that we want creative people who think outside the square, that's the space for you. So alongside an offshore campaign it includes a suite of free sales and marketing tools that the sector can use to leverage off the national campaign and there are numerous other projects supported by the ITP. Kiwi SAS community I've visited, been really impressed with what's going on in that space and also the level of collaboration we're seeing within New Zealand, uh, which seems to be quite different to others. Uh, the expansion of Code Centre of Digital Excellence to support the growth and the game development sector uh, and also uh, supporting a prototype for a digital tech pathway designed by Māori for Māori. A domestic campaign uh, is designed to excite the interest of the tech sector to Korea and to see to reach into young people to make sure we're telling that story locally. And I think we have a whole lot of improving to do, both from a government and an industry perspective. I hear frustrations from um, small businesses who are in the tech sector of attracting and retaining the right people uh, and also meeting salary um, expectations. I'd like to make a, a special mention of the, the Toy Hangaro report. Uh, really impressed to read that. Māori owned technology companies, a great piece of um, research that you can take a look at. It's available online. Really impressed to see um, how visible the success of Māori owned companies are and how they're well punching above their weight in that space. Again, I think it's a really a good emerging part of making us different from the rest of the world. The report pointed out there's a need for strong emphasis on building and retaining skills and this requires better access to training opportunities but also that it's fit for purpose with our industry partners. Improving diversity inclusion, and it was really cool to hear that question at the end, is also a key theme right throughout our, the ITP. Reports like the Digital Skills for Our Digital Future, which was funded by the ITP and done by TechNZ, thank you, uh, provide valuable findings that help us understand the landscape a little bit better, as well as think about the impacts of changes in the demographics of the sector. A lot has been done so far, but I'll leave you uh, to do that work. But I'd really encourage you, if you haven't read that report on Māori tech businesses, to take a look. 
So the next steps, as we as we begin implementing the digital ITP, and we will um, continue to build upon it, uh, we have established a partnership board. And I'd like to um, give thanks to those people who are here today and also joining us online, uh, who are those members of the partnership board and, and for the time and the commitment they have put into developing this. Some of you, um, while they're here this evening, um, I also want to note that ITPs are built on that very concept that working together we can take better advantage of what we have, putting our skills all together in one basket. Progress is always a joint effort and we cannot do it alone. And I really look forward to continuing this positive relationship between industry and government. I recognise we've got a long way to go to see our digital technologies sector reach its full potential, and it will take time. But some of the strategic work that we do now will be uh, beneficial in our long term. The real value of the ITP is the ongoing commitment between both government and industry to work together. And tonight's launch, launch marks a real milestone. The ITP is a process. And the framework and activities in this ITP show the work already underway, but also all of the work we yet have to do together. I'm committed to working alongside the industry to see this sector flourish and grow in the next year, as well as in the long term. I look forward to Budget Day, and I'm sure many of you will as well, uh, and I look forward to keeping the momentum going. Um, I, I guess I would like to close by saying I really see that this sector is one of the most creative and innovative sectors that New Zealand has. And this ITP provides that fundamental uh, framework for us to continue to work together and to like, take full advantage of our ideas, our people, and all of the opportunities that we have. So I'd like to say thank you, and um, and you're more than welcome to ask me questions, even though you probably know all or more than, than I do about tech stuff. So kia ora koutou and, and thank you for having me. I think I just hit the computer and took off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Uh, we'll probably will take you up on questions if you do have well, a moment. Um, and I'd just like to say on behalf of the tech ecosystem, the ITP has been a great framework to operate within for the last few years. It's really helped get a lot of things going and off the ground in those early investments. But despite what may or may not happen on Thursday, there's a lot of stuff happening already. And uh, yeah, just so you're all aware, I think the, the collaboration across uh, various parts of the industry uh, and the and the government agencies has been amazing, and uh, we're actually seeing some of those things actually start to produce results already. Uh, for example, there's a campaign on uh, attracting some talent happening through the See Tomorrow First at the moment, which would be great. Um, but questions, a couple, couple of minutes for questions. There's a mic if you've got a quiet voice. Oh, you've nailed it. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. Yeah, I think there was a piece of research from 
uh, zero that came out today, $7.8 billion of productivity gains with more yeah. shifting those SMEs across into the cloud. So good work. All right, we've got the mic working, I think. Yep, we have. You must have some questions. Yes. Hi, uh, Ian Watson, University of Auckland. Uh, the US recently announced funding for, I think, seven new AI research institutes. AI has been in the news a bit the last few months. Uh, Britain's announced funding for a massive supercomputer for researchers, and I think the EU is going to do something similar. The basic idea is to make sure that AI is not just the privilege of, sorry, Google, big tech companies, and that AI researchers have access to the same tools. Um, look, it's, it's fascinating. I've had to, uh, can you hear me? Can I talk without? Can you hear me without? I'm losing my voice a little bit. So, uh, look, it's been fascinating to watch the development. So things have just gone so so fast. Uh, uh, and uh, I, the, the first point I would make is um, almost with my police hat on is that when you get a new thing, it can be used for good or bad, right? And you, you, you're trying to figure out uh, what are the opportunities that we want to take full advantage of, but how do we get ahead of the misuse of a new tool? Uh, and so I think that's that's all the, the thought process. It's been fascinating to to watch that play out. We have really good discussions at an OECD level with our partners on how we can be working together and taking advantage. We don't have pockets like the U US, obviously, but we do want to stay abreast of, of um, making sure we've got the right framework in place. We've already got pretty good things in terms of the algorithms charter, so saying what's ethical or not. So that's a good starting point, but we do need to do some more work in terms of a wider framework for AI. My fear is that by the time we get someone uh, to, to draft that up, it's just changed, right? Uh, it, it's evolving so rapidly that you almost need some fundamental principles around ethics and use uh, that we agree to, and then it's just going to start changing uh, as soon as you uh, put in place a, a strategy. But look, it's something I keep a close eye on internationally and here, and I'm always keen to have advice on what people think uh, we should be doing more of. I think we have time for everyone. Two more questions. Is I'm back there. Yeah, hola. Hello, my name is Maria Mingayon, and um, I'm a member of the Executive Council of the AI Forum New Zealand. And I also work for Mott McDonald, which is an engineering consultancy firm that works in the construction industry. My question to you, um, Honorable Hongini Anderson, is in the construction industry, we often have the difficulty of, in order to bring up the um, productivity levels, we need um, to have a clear pipeline of projects that don't just expand for three or uh, four years, but that actually look into the next 20 years and what's going to happen, what's in the pipeline, so that we can actually invest in R&D and we can invest in the use of, well, in the use and implementation of the digital tools. So I wonder if there is anything like that planned in combination with the other ministries. Thank you. That's a fascinating question because um, you've got a whole lot of things. We've seen a massive investment in infrastructure uh, since in the last six years. So as part of the, you know, I think in my own area, I've got a uh, an interchange river link that's, you know, 500 million currently, uh, and it will go up because of inflation. You know, and so that's, you know, that's three contractors, you know, some are partnering to be able to do that work. But there's a number of things that have to line up to enable that foresight. You know, it does depend on the government, right? It depends on who's prepared to invest in infrastructure and how they're going to do that in order to provide that certainty. And it also depends on a whole lot of international factors like inflation, like wages, like labour, like supply chains. So it would be lovely to be able to have that foresight, but there are so many variables and the quite volatile global economic uh, environment we're working in currently, that it's it it's it would be a rough estimate no matter what you do and no matter how smart your AI is. Uh, I think there are some factors that depend on things like who wins an election, and if AI can do that, I'd be interested to know. We'll, we'll take. <laughs>
Hello. Okay. Um, Sorry, we'll take this and then one last one there because I do want to make sure that we have time for some networking. Um, so last two questions and then we'll take Sure, thanks. Um, and thank you for being here, um, Minister Aniston. My name is Cathy O'Sullivan. Um, I'm with Foundry, which is a New Zealand, well, it's a tech media company. Um, my question is around um, it, yourself and Judith Collins and a few others are working together when it comes to talking about AI. Are there any other areas of technology or the digital economy, regardless of who wins the election, that you think parties should be talking more about um, when it comes to technology and New Zealand's future? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, there are some areas I think that should be non-negotiables in terms of, um, you know, what are areas that would be good to have for New Zealand's future. And, and there's always discussions around that, like, could we not put things like, I don't know, a GP, can we all just agree that going to your GP is a good idea or that schools, you know, so we have some basic stuff. And look, I would be a strong advocate for in an area where we are, have such great skills and ability, should we not get agreement? But the trick always comes that when you get into the heat of politics, that those things are, are traded for points, you know, for points or a news grab. So uh, the one area, the only area we've been able to consistently agree and move together on is treaty settlements. So uh, if we could take some lessons from the fact that both Labour and National have agreed to a set framework, we've not politicised that. Uh, we've just said we've got a commitment to resolving treaty claims because we believe this is important for not only our national identity, but for social cohesion and a whole range of stuff. So that's one example. All the rest, when it comes into the heat of, uh, you know, tax cuts versus uh, funding nurses and teachers, that just turns into... Um, into a debate where things are so and that's part of the adversarial nature of the political system so i'd be keen for that chat oh i used to work for judith when i worked in police so maybe we'll have a chat and see where we can get to last question uh kia ora, minister uh, chris claridge from the trust alliance incorporated uh first thing first point is thank you for the trust identity services train cool. work act brilliant piece of legislation world class Brilliant thing that will enable digital identities, verifiable credentials and enable an import layer for the lady from the blockchain world. Um, the key question is, is there going to be adequate resourcing applied to DIA to enable the rules framework to be put in place? Because it's arguably been underfunded and under-resourced to enable it and it's had to be pushed out to enable it to be actually executed in July next year will and i'm not seeking an indication to an answer but is there a recognition that resourcing and within dia it sounds strange to us from the private sector to get resources yeah. into government be applied to enabling the act to be put into place one of the areas i'm really if i if i get the job back after the election uh what are the the longer term goals i have is to have a wider integration across all the public service on how we do our tech, how we do things, because it is quite haphazard, to be honest, and, and MB actually could teach um, a few lessons in terms of how they've done a single business number, like in terms of the one touch that we provide small businesses, we should be aspiring to do that same level for people accessing public services, no matter where they go to. So part of the problem is the budget cycle, is that putting a bid in for one thing uh when it gets weighed up with is cyclone more recovery more important than x or is y or you know what is the thing what i would like to evolve to and i'm nowhere near it yet is to actually have uh, a way that we continue these are structural uh these go right across they're not like a one-off vertical funding they should be horizontal right across uh, government departments and we if we want to be uh, if the government wants to stand up and talk to a private industry and talk about the importance of um, the, using the cloud, the importance of um, having um, a good uplift, on, not only your uplift in cloud, but cyber security, I believe that we need to be best practice in terms of our public service. And we've got a long way to go yet. And part of that is the politics and the budget cycle that prevents that longer term building of capability and saves money, to be frank, because you've got different departments doing different things. So sorry, that was a very long-winded way of answering the fact that I'll continue. I, it's important work we need to get done. 
but I think we also need to do things differently so that we don't see, um, uh, I guess, the bones of where we need to be in the future uh, aren't just st standalone budget bids, they are integrated into the way of we're doing things. So that's probably a really nerdy long way of answering it, sorry. That's a great answer. And, uh, and I think it's it's baked into things like the industry transform transformation plan and the digital strategy. So hopefully we can all advocate for those sorts of things, no matter who wins, keeps the wheels it's, in well, The aim is to stop fighting with Treasury. So if that sort of stuff is built in, then 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 it, like we don't have to do that. It's, if we want to be small, nimble, smart, creative, amazing that we can be, things like that should be said and done and, and agreed that that's, there's multiple benefits, not for, us, for our skills, for our, our industry and all around. So it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. Well, I know everyone's got lots of questions they want to ask, but now all your comfortable hands are going up, but I'm going to call it quits here. <laughs> the Minister's had a very big day. She might like to join you for a glass of wine before she shoots off. I want to thank the Minister very much for the presentation, for launching and nailing that ITP. It's gone live. Excellent. Uh, and you all for coming. Thank you very much. Um, please join us for uh, a little bit more networking before you go. If you're viewing this from Tech Week TV, uh, sorry. Never mind. <laughs> Should have been here. And with that, welcome to Tech Week. Thank you. Thank you.